Welcome to the Project Zion podcast. This podcast explores the unique spiritual and theological gifts Community of Christ offers for today's world. Welcome to Project Zion podcast. I'm your host, Susan Oxley from Seattle, Washington. Uh, And I'm a member of the North American Climate Justice Team, which is sponsored by the Greater Pacific Northwest Mission Center of Community of Christ. In this series, Climate Brewing, uh, we are interviewing scientists, professors, and experts who've already given presentations uh, as part of the Climate Webinar Series, All of Creation from Crises to Transformation. Today, I have with me Dr. Richard Waugh, Professor Emeritus from the University of Wisconsin. Rich brings to this webinar a specialty in social geography, his personal experiences with multiple populations struggling with the impact of climate change around the world, and his skill as a teacher. Rich is an elder in the community of Christ and serves in the Lancaster, Wisconsin congregation, and he's also, yay, my brother. And it's a joy to talk with him about a topic that is near and dear to both our hearts, climate change. Um, Rich, first of all, what does it mean to be a specialty, to have a specialty in social geography? Well, and actually we tend to call it human geography, but it's the the same basic thing. Um, It means it's looking at the, uh, well, my definition of geography is the stuff that makes the world make sense. You know, so it's it's information that makes the world make sense. And in this case, human geography is the stuff related to human and human cultures and human perceptions and human actions that help make the world make sense. Okay. And so um, it, it's very all embracive, all, all inclusive. It, include, it includes religion and economics, um, politics, um, you know, language, culture, popular culture, all different kinds of things. Um, but it also a, a major part of it, a major part of what I have been doing is uh, environmental perception is part of that too. So how people perceive the environment because that's how they act in the environment. So um, the things I've spent the most time thinking about in this uh, regard are religion and environmental perception. So I have some uh, real interest in the environment as well. Well, that's great. Well, you've done two webinars for us uh, on climate change and human impact. And um, human impact can be interpreted in several ways. It could mean impact that humans have had on the global environment and climate over time. It could mean the impact that climate change has had on humans, you know, with environmental emergencies and things like that. And it could mean the impact that humans can still have and exert on the growing climate crises. So you touched on all three of those in your webinars. Um, And I'd like to start the discussion, and I'd like to kind of uh, touch on all three of those if we have time, and I'd like to start the discussion with the ways humans have impacted the environment and created climate change. Um, We've had the IPCC report just recently, uh, which I'll have you define, (laughs) and um, then we also you know, know that there's a portion of the population that still questions whether humans have had an impact on the climate or if it's just all natural progression. So I'd like to have you comment on both of those things, the IPCC report and that question of human impact on climate. Yeah, so I'm sure a lot of your listeners know the IPCC stands for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, it's a consortium of uh, many hundreds of scientists from around the world. And their, their job in a simplistic way of, of putting it is to read everything, study everything, everything related to climate change. And then, and there's just an unbelievable amount of stuff on climate change, thousands, tens of thousands of scholarly papers and so forth. So more than any one person could ever hope to, to read. 
So you get all these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of experts and, and specialists to read all this stuff and to study all this stuff. It's all stuff they know. They're all, uh, you know, scientists who study climate change. And their job then is periodically they put out a summary uh, of this. They, they just synthesize all of this information. And it's like, what do we know now about climate change? And they um, put out these reports at varying intervals. Um, it's been a bit of a, it's usually seven years is what they shoot for is seven years. And this one happened to be the sixth one. The first one came out in 1990. Um, so uh, it, it's an interesting to note that scientists were calling this climate change back in the 1980s when the IPCC was founded because that's the name of the group. And the first report came out in 1990 and had real impact. Uh, that first report did um, on uh, the policies of some countries and so forth. And it, and it helped lead to the Kyoto Accords and things like that. Um, but the, the sixth report that came out is, um, they, oh, by the way, I, I'll mention also, they tend to have a reputation for being sort of conservative. Uh, they don't call something unless they're really sure that's what's going on. Uh, they're not speculative at all. And if they do make any speculations, they tell you up front, you know, this is low confidence. We're not sure this is true. This part, what I'm about to tell you, you know, it's not true. Uh, it may not be true. We don't know. We think it is, but we're not sure. But they have a lot of things that they uh, say is high confidence. And this is like stuff you can bet the farm on is absolutely happening. And so what the, the sixth report, which just came out, I think, within the last month, um, the, uh, oh, and one other thing the IPCC does, which is really useful, is they produce a, uh, a short, the, the report's very long, but they, uh, they make a short version of it, which is designed for policymakers. They want people who are uh, involved in making policy to be able to understand all this stuff. So they write it in such a way that they hope that any reasonably uh, cogent uh, policymaker can understand. And those, those are, are short, 15 pages or 20 pages, something like that. Um, and I'll be honest with you, that's the only part of it I've read myself so far. I haven't read the rest of it, but I have read the policy, uh, the, the summary for policymakers. And in that, they're, they're very open about the, the difficulties. Some of the highlights that came out of that is that um, they said each of the last four decades has been warmer than the previous decade. And every decade is setting a new record. Um, they're unequivocal about this with very high confidence that this is anthropogenic, it's caused by people. Um, so uh, the, the, it's also unequivocal, high confidence that you know, carbon dioxide levels are increasing in the atmosphere and they've got all the numbers you, want, you could possibly want to, to take a look at that. Um, they spent a lot of time comparing historical things into current things and seeing how the trends are going. Uh, they, they make a point of saying that every single region on the earth is impacted. Every single region on the earth is, <clears throat> is suffering uh, from climate change impacts now. Some even more so than others. Africa and, and uh, Southeast Asia are among the ones who are suffering the most. Um, so there's lots of good stuff in there. Um, <clears throat> I would encourage people to, if they ever hear a politician saying, how am I supposed to know about climate change? I'm not a scientist then just tell them, well, IPCC is putting out things just for people like you. And there's no excuse for you not to know about climate change because anybody can read the, the summary statement and should be able to understand it. Okay. So that's a little bit about the IPCC. Is that more than you wanted? So. Thank you. Thank you. That's good. <laughs> uh, but you also mentioned something about whether human activity has really made any difference on climate change. Is it real? Is it all that kind of stuff. And, and that's a, uh, an important issue because a lot of people are looking for reasons, um, I think, not to want to do anything about it. So for those who wonder if climate change really uh, is human caused or if humans had anything to do with it, I'd like to point out that the human impact on, on uh, the earth has been enormous in the last century. Um, just really remarkable amounts of changes have taken place. 
We've done a few things in which we've done some positive remediation. Um, some kinds of air and water pollution in some places are better than it used to be. Um, one thing which I think I, I think is hopeful is the Montreal Protocol uh, has done a, a allowed us to put a limit on ozone depleting gases, uh, which is seems to have checked the downward spiral of ozone depletion. And I think over the next few decades, we'll probably we'll probably start seeing some re recovery of that, some repair of that. So those are some positive things. But overall, the overall damage has been very real and very serious. And it's so extensive that a new geologic epic called the Anthropocene has, is now being recognized. And I thought I'd mention uh, something about this because shifts in geologic periods of time are often marked by catastrophes. Um, for example, the end of the Cretaceous period and the beginning of the tertiary period was the coincides with the time when the asteroid hit the earth and caused the ex mass extinctions, uh, including those of the dinosaurs. And so what they're saying basically is the tertiary world was so much different than the Cretaceous world that we need to have a new geologic you know, time period there. Um, the establishment of the Anthropocene uh, is simply an acknowledgement that humans have altered the earth in such a profound way that a new geologic period of time is necessary to describe it. In other words, the humans have produced such a change in the earth's environment that it rivals the kinds of changes that caused new geologic periods in the past to be formed. So that's an indication of, of just the incredible impact that humans have had on the planet. Uh, it just looks different. The world is different than it would have been otherwise. The, of all the systems of the Earth, though, the hardest hit have been the, has been the atmosphere. And that's where the processes which lead to climate change are basically occurring. And it's important to realize that the atmosphere is very, very thin. Uh, there's not much to it. Uh, we're, our whole life and our whole existence on this planet depends on just a few miles, basically, of atmosphere. 50% um, of it is only three and a half miles thick uh, off the surface of the earth. And 80% of it uh, is 11 miles. So that's not very much, but, um, <clears throat> excuse me. But in addition to that, uh, uh, the vast majority of the atmosphere, 99.9% .9 is comprised of three gases, nitrogen, oxygen, and argon. But the other one-tenth of one percent is a whole host of gases, which are called trace gases, because they're found in very, very tiny amounts. And um, those trace gases are absolutely essential to us surviving on the planet. We absolutely have to have those, even though they're found in very, very small amounts. One of those trace gases is carbon dioxide. And what because they occur in such really small amounts, it's very easy to have a profound impact on the relative amount of those gases. Um, so- I didn't realize that carbon dioxide was a trace gas in the atmosphere. Yeah, totally my, a trace gas. My impression was that most of the atmosphere was carbon dioxide. No, no, it's a trace gas. It's found in very, very small quantities. Um, You're talking about usually. Usually, or I guess well. I guess even now. Even now. Um, but the point being that since it's so little, I mean, an analogy you might use is, um, this is probably a, a imperfect analogy, but if, uh, you know, pick a, a billionaire, you know, you know, Bill Gates is walking down the street and he sees a $20 bill on the, on the, concrete, he probably wouldn't even pick it up. I mean, who cares, right? But if, because uh, the, the impact of that is not very great on him, right? But if you had somebody who was a, uh, you know, an indigent or homeless man who saw a $20 bill, they would definitely pick it up because it would have a huge impact on their total amount of wealth because they had so little wealth to begin with, right? Well, in this case, carbon dioxide, there's so little of it that just a little bit of carbon dioxide is going to have a huge impact on changing that amount. I see. So um, we people say, how can we possibly have 
you know, the atmosphere is so giant and big, and how could we possibly have had any kind of impact on this? Well, the truth is the atmosphere is not that big. And what we're impacting there is, is a gas that's not found in very large quantities in the atmosphere, but is absolutely essential to us surviving on this planet. And right now, uh, the levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere are about 50% higher than they were at the beginning of the industrial age. So we've had a profound impact on how much carbon dioxide there's been in the atmosphere. You know, and it's easy to do because there wasn't that much to begin with, right? Um, but we know for a fact, absolutely for a fact, that carbon dioxide is, traps heat in the atmosphere. So the fact that we've increased it by 50% means we, there's no other way anything could happen except that the earth would get warmer because that's what carbon dioxide does in the atmosphere is it makes the earth warm, you know? Um, uh, of course, there was an equilibrium amount which kept the earth at a very equitable temperature. We are messing with that now. And the amount of carbon dioxide is going up, uh, like I said, to uh, levels we haven't seen in, in the IPCC says uh, in, in many, in about 2 million years at least, uh, if not more. So, um, it's not surprising that the atmosphere is getting warmer. So for those who say humans just can't have that kind of impact and so forth, yes, they can, we have done it. We, we have put that much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere because uh, it's easy to change that much carbon dioxide. I, I hope that uh, explains it. Yeah, thank you, that was very helpful. So, so we have impacted the climate mm -hmm. via the amount of carbon dioxide and, and other gases like methane and stuff like that, that we've been putting sure. in the atmosphere. And now the climate is impacting us um, in ways that certainly are making the news. I don't think anybody would deny that climate change affects us and the catastrophes are just enormous. Right. I, I'd like to um, have you just comment, if you would, on the recent uh, climate crises that are occurring and maybe relate that in some way to the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and methane and whatever. Yeah. Um, so the, the list of climate change impacts on humanity is, is really very long. Uh, and I, I don't think we need to go through every one of them because it would take hours and hours and hours to do that. Um, but certainly, uh, you know, some of the recently discussed uh, problems that people have talked about in the media a lot and so forth have been things like heat waves and droughts and associated wildfires that have accompanied them. These are absolutely uh, the fingerprints of climate change are all over these, these events. Um, none of these things would have happened the way they did without, you know, increased temperatures and, and the impacts of climate change. Um, Southern Europe right now, even as we speak this very moment, is experiencing the, their worst heat wave ever. Um, Spain just yesterday, I think it was, set their all-time record high temperature. And two days ago, the all-time, which is 117 and a half degrees. Um, a couple days ago in Sicily, the all-time record high temperature for all of the continent of Europe was set at 120 degrees. Um, it's not coincidental that tied to all of that, there are wildfires raging in the south of France right now, burning down towards the, the Mediterranean, um, including a bunch of towns down, down gradient there, which uh, could be an interesting problem. Those kinds of things are not reported a lot in the American media because we, we kind of tend to focus on ourselves a lot, but we've had similar kinds of things as I think people know um, in terms of the uh, unusually high temperatures, the unusual long-term drought of the American West, um, and then the extensive wildfires, which have seemingly come every year now. And right now, again, even as we speak, uh, we're looking at the Dixie Fire in California, which is the second largest fire in California history, um, has already burned two complete towns to the ground and is threatening a town, you'll appreciate this, threatening a town called Susanville, um, which uh, yeah. had a population of 15,000 people. And they're already starting to evacuate people from Susanville for, uh, for that. 
Um, all of that, you know, is is a real implications or, or uh, evidence of climate change being being very real. We should point out these are not just local events or local impacts. Um, I live in Platteville, Wisconsin, um, and during the time of the bootleg fire in Oregon, uh, which is 2,000 miles away from us, we had for multiple days in a row, we had unhealthy air conditions here in Platteville from the smoke from the bootleg fire and some other fires in the, in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and we had people who were having, I, I noticed it, I could smell the fire uh, and people with respiratory problems were having real serious issues. That's mm -hmm. 2000 miles away. So um, what happens is, what's happening is, is these things are starting to happen every year. Europe seems to have heat waves every summer now. Uh, they've even had heat waves in, in the late winter, uh, much warmer temperatures than they should have. Um, we're seeing these wildfires every year in the West. You know, these are, this is going to be the, the new, it's becoming the new normal. And we're, this is going to continue to be a problem, I think, for most of the 21st century. We should also point out that um, Death Valley last month recorded 130 degrees which is the highest, it's usually assumed to be the highest precisely measured temperature that any human has ever recorded on planet Earth. Um, that's an incredibly high temperature. Um, so we're seeing this thing happening over and over and over again. There's all kinds of other things we can talk about in terms of human impacts. Um, larger and more numerous hurricanes, and we're seeing uh, hurricanes hitting earlier in the season, lasting later in the season, hitting more frequently uh, land masses and so forth. Um, we've seen the spread of disease uh, amongst human beings. Uh, a wide variety of those are tied to climate change because of course, ecotones or e ecosystems are moving poleward uh, with, uh, with, with the increasing temperatures. Uh, we've seen so, the increasing- So pursue that a minute, Rich. Sure. Excuse me, but um, explain a little bit more why increased disease is related to climate change. Make that connection for me a little more clear. Well, I, I can give you a specific example. Um, there's a, a tick that uh, is called the Lone Star Tick. And it's got that name for apparently two reasons. One, it, it was very common in Texas, which is the Lone Star State. But they're also the female of the tick has a big white dot on her back and it looks like a, a lone star, you know. Oh. So uh, unfortunately, this is one of the ticks that carries a uh, disease. It's called lone star ehrlichiosis. Um, and it can be very serious. Um, uh, it can be debilitating and if it's not treated properly, it can be debilitating for decades. It can even be fatal in some cases. Um, but this was a, a disease that was only found in the southern states, in Texas and places like that. Over the last few years, we've now had multiple cases of that in Wisconsin. Oh. So what's happened is the, the warm belt that allows for the Lone Star tick to survive is moving northward and the ticks are moving with it. And they've come into Wisconsin and now we're starting to get that disease here, you see. And this has happened over and over again. The West Nile virus, which is spread throughout the entire United States, first came to the United States in 1999. Um, and it was a climate change thing. The Zika virus was uh, spread through climate change as it moved to other areas. Uh, and there's going on and on. Malaria is making a resurgence, especially in, the, in Africa, uh, from zones which are getting, um, especially elevation zones, which are you know, becoming warmer through climate change. Uh, and there's lots and lots of other examples of that, but that's those are some of the examples. Do you think that our recent pandemic um, has anything to do with climate change, or is that is that I, speculative? That would be very speculative, and I don't have any information on that, so I'm not going to uh, speculate on that too much. Okay. Uh, I think that the the pandemic, the COVID pandemic, um, has a lot more to do with the globalized economy. And the fact that it spread so rapidly was because we're so incredibly interconnected. 
and also because people refused to do the right thing to help contain the, the spread of it. Uh, we could have controlled it much more easily if people had, had done the right thing. Um, <clears throat> is it, it, it may turn out that it, somehow it had something to do with climate change. I don't know that yet though, and I don't, I'm not gonna speculate on that. Okay, thank you for an honest answer. I, I just was curious. Yeah, sure. So okay. those are all some of the things that, you know, where it's, it's impacted people. Well, I've also heard recently um, that the um, the Gulf Stream is becoming less stable. Yes, it is. And that that could impact a huge number of nations. Do you want to talk to us about that? Yeah, the Gulf Stream um, is complicated, to yeah. say the least. It, it, most people, I think, know have heard of the Gulf Stream as a you can think of it as like a, a river of water in the ocean. <laughs> um, it's a, a current in the ocean. Uh, it, it forms in the uh, tropical uh, oceans uh, near the equator, uh, just north of the equator, uh, off the coast of Africa. So it's a hot current, it's a warm current and uh, swings across uh, the Atlantic Ocean and then makes a big turn uh, around a, a, a giant, kind of permanent high pressure system that resides over Bermuda in that area. Um, just makes a big turn and then shoots back across the Northern Atlantic Ocean and it bathes Europe in this relatively warm water, which is why Europe, which is uh, at a really high latitude, like central Canada latitudes, uh, is way less cold usually than central Canada is. Um, and this is one reason why Europe was populated and has 700 million people living there is because they had this really spectacular, wonderful weather because of the Gulf Stream. So now the Gulf Stream, um, now Europe is, is not, their weather is not quite so spectacular because it's getting increasingly warm. Uh, that's mostly from atmospheric warming, but um, the Gulf Stream itself does look to be coming unstable. Uh, and the reason why is because of melting from the uh, Arctic ice, uh, Arctic sea ice uh, in the Arctic Ocean. Um, and when that, those, that ice melts, it's melting at rates never seen before. Again, the IPCC points this out, that it's, it's uh, melting at rates never seen before. And there's a chance that the Arctic Ocean will be ice free as soon as 2030 something like that without any ice at all in the summertime. It'll reform in the winter, but then it'll be gone in the summer. So all that ice goes someplace and it's going down to two currents. One's called the Labrador current, one's called the Greenland current. And those are cold currents and they're pointed perpendicularly right at the Gulf Stream. Uh -oh. So what it's doing is just like a head on, I mean, a, a broadside collision with the Gulf Stream. And this is causing the Gulf Stream to become unstable. So there's all kinds of speculation on what's going to happen with the Gulf Stream. Um, it's already showing signs of instability, though. And what impact that's going to have on Europe is hard to say. Um, lots of speculations, but that's one of the things people have talked about. OK, and there's also rivers of air in the atmosphere right. that are fairly permanent or have been fairly permanent that are also showing signs of instability. Is that correct? That's true. The upper airflow is what it's often called. Um, it forms where you have cold air in the north and warm air in the south. And where they hit is a really strong temperature gradient. And it's not necessary to go through the physics of it right now. But uh, if any of you know the ideal gas law, you can use that that gas law to prove that temperature gradients uh, create uh, pressure gradients, you know. And so since the pressure gradient is being created by the temperature contrast, um, what's happening is you get a, a, a river of air in the atmosphere, which is flowing along. And it's hugely important in determining what, what weather we get down here at the surface. Um, it, often goes through cycles where it will swing wildly up and down north and south and then it'll go kind of straight across east west without moving and so forth and what we're seeing now is those that looping action is much greater than it used to be so the uh one of the reasons why uh 
you know, the Pacific Northwest got such an incredible spell of hot weather that was in June, I believe, um, was because uh, a, a deeply, well, the, the upper airflow was wildly, it's called azonal, wildly up and down. Um, and it brought really warm air up, which then got trapped uh, on a high pressure that was just offshore. And the Pacific Northwest just sweltered. I think you had temperatures of 115 or 16 or 17 degrees, didn't you? That's right. Um, that's unheard of. You know, that's the kind of stuff that happens. But it also explains why Texas got such a bizarre cold snap uh, in this last winter. Because... Ooh the upper airflow was deeply diving south and brought all that Arctic air, sucked it all down. And so you're getting these bigger extremes of the upper airflow. And so Texas could have, Texas is mostly just gonna be blazing hot, but they could not and probably uh, have really cold winters every once in a while, like they did this last year. And you know, places that normally don't get 115 degrees might start getting that more frequently. I see. So, that is becoming a little more unstable because you're getting bigger temperature contrasts between uh, the air masses which are causing the upper airflow. And so it means that uh, it's, it's more mobile, it's more, more un unstable. So Rich, the developing nations that you've been talking about, like Europe, like the United States, we've also got Australia and New Zealand and you know, a number of other industrialized nations, and um, we, because of our industrialization, we are responsible for getting a great deal of the carbon dioxide into the atmosphere with all of our fossil fuel and petroleum based products. And yet um, you've mentioned that the places that are experiencing some of the worst of the climate crises um, include Southeast Asia and Africa that are not industrialized. So when we start talking about human impact, it's not equal across the board. There right. is no equity. And, and the climate doesn't care whether there's equity or not. It's what it does. That is indeed true. Um, it's it's a, a truly unfortunate truth uh, that the way our society is structured, that people who are marginalized or have little always suffer the worst in any kind of crisis or disaster or catastrophe. Um, and for reasons which are not important to go into now, but there are certainly areas of the world which have been made to be poor by the processes that have made us wealthy, you know? And so there's an enormous gaps between rich and poor nations and rich and poor people. Um, and the more money you have, the more fossil, fossil fuels you're going to, you know, in general, the more fossil fuels you'll put out into the atmosphere. But the, the atmosphere is incredibly well mixed. It's, it's extremely well mixed. Um, uh, just as a, an example of that, I read somewhere that every time you take a breath, the odds are that you're breathing molecules that have been through the respiratory system of everybody else on Earth. You know, that's how thoroughly mixed uh, the atmosphere is. And so it means that even though we have a lot of carbon dioxide coming out of the United States and Europe and Japan and places like that, it's mixed throughout the Earth. And so the impacts are found throughout the earth. It's just that the impacts are more substantial in places where they don't have the money for remediation of those. Uh, you can imagine um, that the South is go South American South is gonna have a real problem with climate change because it's gonna get uh, almost unlivably hot in the next few decades. Um, but they have air conditioning, you know, and they can always just retreat into their, as long as the power holds out, they can retreat into their, their homes and their cars and so forth. Um, a place like, uh, you know, 
the areas of the Sahel, for example, in Africa, which are also blisteringly hot, they don't have that. They're, they're living at 110, 115, 120 degrees, you know, and, and <clears throat> that takes it out of you. And then it's limited, it's kind of a limit of what you can do, you, you know, in terms of, of developing yourself and, and so forth. And so it's going to hit them much harder, you know, than it would somebody in Mobile, Alabama, for example. Um, and that's just the way it goes. So um, I would argue that we have a responsibility to other people, you know, knowing this. Uh, there, there's some people say, oh, I don't think it's bothering me very much. So, you know, it doesn't, no big deal for me. So why should I care? Um, that seems to me ethically inappropriate to argue that something is only important if it affects me directly. It seems like a, a shallow ethis, uh, ethic for people to have. But there's a couple of things you can say about that. One is, is that climate change is affecting every single square inch of the, of the planet right now. And it's affecting every single person on the planet. And maybe you don't recognize that because you've got all the infrastructure uh, you know, filters which are keeping you going in the midst of all this. Uh, but it's very true and it's gonna get worse. Um, but it's also, I would think people would start feeling um, a responsibility to other people when they realize that what I'm doing is causing other people to suffer really seriously. So right now we're looking at, I just read one uh, report, they're, they're thinking maybe 500,000 deaths a year right now from climate change in the oh, world. Um, something on that, on that order, it's hard to, to know, but something on that order. And then another report I read recently, um, said that uh, the lifetime emissions of three and a half Americans leads to one death from climate change. Now that doesn't three and a half Americans. Americans? Will lead to a death. And I'm not sure exactly how that was calculated, but uh, this is, these were people who knew what they were doing. Um, that doesn't sound like much, but you realize we have almost, well, we have 335 million people in the United States. That's close meaning that America, the United States is gonna be responsible for a hundred million deaths from climate change. That's our responsibility. And most of that's gonna come from some other places. And you can use that kind of metric to see the relative impact of climate change. Uh, other industrialized advanced nations don't have a, a number nearly like that. The UK, for example, their number is 9.4 people. So it's uh, one third as much of an impact per person as in the United States. And of course, in, in other countries, in Brazil, it's 26 people, or in Nigeria, it's 146. You know, so there's a real difference in how uh, the, uh, the relative impact that people have on this and the responsibility that we have, I think, for uh, caring for other people is a reason in and of itself for us to do something about this. I mean, what kind of people would we be if we said, I don't care if 100 million people die? You know, I got my goodies. <laughs> I mean, who, who really thinks that way, you know? Um, but that's kind of where we're at now with this. So it's, it's really kind of shocking. And I should say that the person, the, the, one of the authors of that study said, they're convinced also that their numbers are a vast underestimate. They think it's way worse than that. So they were again being conservative on those numbers, but they think it's way worse than that, meaning the United States would be responsible for even more deaths than that 3.5 figure would suggest. Now, I'm not trying to beat up on the United States. I'm just saying that uh, it seems like uh, there's a place there for us to ethically and morally take responsibility for doing something to try to help people uh, live better lives. And what is that something? What should we be doing? Well, I would argue there's probably three big categories of, I mean, at first I should say, you know, the human race isn't doomed. Everybody isn't gonna die, but unfortunately, um, a lot of people are going to die. Another study 
said 83 million are going to die by 2100, and that's a, a definitely an underestimate. You know, it's going to be more than that. Almost everybody seems to think. So, what should we do if we do care about this? And I think there are three general categories. I think technology is going to have a role to play. Uh, there's lots of people who are working very hard on trying to find technological fixes, um, energy sources which don't depend or don't produce carbon, for example, um, ways of using carbon, um, using energy more effectively and more efficiently so you don't use so much of it. And I think all of those are going to be important. I, I think there it is. I, I have a couple, of <coughs> excuse me, a couple of concerns about technology. One is a lot of people think it's it's going to solve the problem completely, and I don't. I'm sure it will not solve the problem completely. And in fact, for technology to help at all, it requires that we do the other two categories. You know, uh, is the only way we can make technology work. Um, so it's not going to solve the problem by itself, but it's going to have a role to play. Uh, the other thing I worry about with technology is there's some really uh, far out technological solutions that people have suggested, which are going to be unbelievably expensive, probably completely impractical, and are, have a real good chance of causing more damage than they're going to help. You know, so we have to be careful with that. We need to, to start talking about appropriate technology. What's appropriate for this? You know, um, here's something where we can do that. We have not been good at all about looking at the social cost of technology. If somebody invents something, people use it regardless of what it does to people, you know? And we need to start thinking about social costs of technology, I think. But technology will have a, a role to play. But I think there's another category of things that people can do, uh, and which are gonna be, it's gonna be critical, is to make structural changes in society. Uh, we have, it's a simple logic. The way we built the world, the way we built our culture, especially, is what's caused the problem. This is what's caused climate change. We can't continue doing that. Right. Expect it to fix the problem, you know? So we're going to have to rethink the way we structured our society, which is going to mean real strong structural uh, alterations. Um, I, I really think one of the things we can do is for people to start really taking democracy seriously. And by that, I mean to do the really hard work of seriously investing in finding out what people who are running for office really believe and, and finding the people who are committing themselves to doing something about climate change in a positive way, you know, and voting for those people. Mm -hmm. you know? um, we, we just, our democracy has devolved to the place where uh, it's sort of a, if I vote for this guy, it'll make you mad. So I'm going to vote for you for this guy, or um, this guy's got a, a flashy commercial on television or on the internet that I liked. And, uh, and you, you know, we need a, a more serious connection to democracy where people really look seriously at this and then make it a priority to vote for people who are going to do something. Because the reason why this is important is, is because a lot of the ways of addressing this have to come from upper levels. You know, uh, law is really critical in all this. You know, um, the Paris Accords of 2015 are a good example of that. You know, if, um, if we can abide by those accords, it's, it's a it's a small step, but it's a step forward in, in addressing climate change. Without that, we wouldn't have we wouldn't have that small step forward. You know, uh, there really is a role to play for for law and for international cooperation and so forth. We need politicians who are going to commit to that, and we need Americans who are going to um, uh, find those people and vote for them. So when we are hearing about the Glasgow summit that is coming up in November, yeah. um, that would be in this category of international um, 
guidelines and law. Right, exactly. Um, there have been annual summits, uh, climate change summits, starting in 1992, I think. Um, most of them don't make much press. The Paris one that gave us the, those accords in 2015 was one of those. Um, and they're designed, and the Glasgow one is going to be important because they're reviewing the Paris Accords and reviewing how people have adopted those. And they're going to try to uh, hold people's feet to the fire to try to get them to do more of that. that I see. Of yeah. Um, but these are, these are important. And I, I put a lot of stock in this. I think this is going to be a real part of the solution. We also need to do that in, in domestic you know, around the world, we need to have democracy around the world and domestic policies from politicians and from policymakers and so forth who are going to um, address uh, climate change in a positive way. Mm -hmm. uh, a really dangerous thing that for some reason is widely believed is that all politicians are exactly alike and they're all idiots. Uh, this is not true. <laughs> Uh, there are good people out there who are trying to do the right thing and they're not all alike and you need to uh, sort through all of this and find the good from the bad and, and uh, in, in real ways. Another structural change which I think is important is, is uh, in terms of the way we think about economic systems. You know, our economic systems is what brought us this problem. We cannot continue doing our economic systems the way we always have. We need to develop and embrace economic systems that put a priority on environment, you know, that that going to make that important, as important as profits, or even more important than profits, you know, uh, and climate change in particular. So that needs to become a really extremely important part of the decision making in economics. And it has never been that way in uh, our culture. And that's why we have this problem. We need to make sure that becomes part of that and people have to buy into that and do that. So that's the second thing that people can do is, is to seek out those kinds of solutions. Okay. The third one, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, I just wanted to make sure that I, I was following, okay. Yeah. The third um, category is lifestyle changes. These are at the individual level and there's a lot to be said for individuals to examine their own lives um, and see where they can make a difference. Um, one of the things which I think is absolutely essential is our culture and our society is strongly based on individualism. And there's a lot of good evidence to suggest that individualism has been increasing in recent decades to the point where it's become toxic and we need to let that go. We have got to get out of beyond ourselves. Um, I think we're not only at a point, we're beyond the point where we have to start um, thinking about community, thinking about other people. It may seem like a kumbaya, you know, poster kind of thing and that's trite and all that, but it is absolutely, I think, fundamental to the, to the solution of climate change. We have to start thinking about other people. Um, we have to develop political systems and economic systems and individual lifestyles based on the idea that other people matter. You know, that other people are important, not just me. You know, it's not just what I want. You know, it's other people are important. Um, if we do that, then climate change can be very effectively addressed. It means that people will think about their purchases in terms of how that that impacts other people. Uh, they'll be thinking about how their politics affects other people. They'll be thinking about how their recreation affects other people, how their religion affects other people, um, how pretty much everything they do affects other people. Um, and in all of that, you know, the way we live and think and worship and consume and learn, all of that has to be pursued with the idea that we have a responsibility to provide for the good of the larger community. I'm absolutely convinced this is where we're gonna to have to go. Uh, we have to somehow develop this. We have to get beyond this. You know, humans have the capacity to live that way. People do it. There are people out there who are living this way, you know? To live in selfish individualism is a choice we make. We're not destined to do that. 
it's a choice we make. We decide we're going to do that. And I would argue that uh, it's not inevitable. We can choose to live in a way where we can try to build sustainable communities around the world. You know, uh, if for no other reason than those places we mentioned in Africa or Southeast Asia or whatever, which are suffering so much, will suffer less. And maybe we won't have 100 million people die. You know, maybe we won't. Maybe we'll care for them. But I think it's more than that. I think that by thinking about this and, and looking at the, the broader picture and seeing how the world is going to be impacted, uh, our own lives will become more sustainable. And we'll be thinking about how other people can do that. And so it'll be easy for us to know what to do, you know, what to buy, how to act, where to go, and, and you know, how we worship and all, how we do religion, how we do education, how we do all these things, you know. It all seems like it's going to work. So it, it seems like living that way means we'll embrace appropriate technology and community oriented politics and economics and religion and adopt lifestyles that are environmentally sustainable. And if we do, the specter of climate change is going to diminish. And it absolutely will. Um, it's hard because we have the world we have because people like it. They like all the stuff. They like all the things. They like the really fast trucks that they drive. They like they like all this stuff, you know. They like having 14, you know, snowmobiles and boats and cars and trucks and things. They like that kind of stuff. It's fun. It's exciting. But I would, I guess, what I'm arguing is, is you, you need we need to get beyond ourselves at some point and say, I don't need all that stuff. And if I don't have all that stuff, maybe there's more for other people, and maybe there'll be less carbon dioxide being generated. You know, and that's just one example, but I mean, there's, there's lots of ways I think this can impact how people live their lives. It seems utopian and maybe even naive. I'm sure people are thinking that, but I'm convinced that people have that capacity if they just do it, if they just start thinking about other people and make that a commitment in their lives. I think we have that capacity and I'm hoping for, I'm hoping for it. I'm hoping with you, Rich. Thank you very much. Um, it's about time to close out our uh, podcast now, but are there any additional comments, any closing comments you'd like to make that would be helpful? Well, I hope they'll be helpful, but we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, there's a lot of people who um, fit into the category of climate deniers. Uh, and and the, more, the one that people often think about are the people who don't believe in the science or don't believe that it's uh, that's being that they say it's being just manufactured out of nothing or they, for political reasons they don't want to believe in it. But there's another kind of it seems to me there's another kind of climate denier, um, the people who have just kind of given up and have just felt like. Um, there's nothing I can do. It's too big of a problem. What difference does it make if I do anything? Uh, right. you know, the, my neighbors aren't doing anything. Why should I? You know, that kind of thing. And it, it seems like this is a, a time when we can bring in maybe uh, an ethical approach or an ethical view of climate change. Because it seems to me that climate change lends itself to this kind of idea of thinking about it ethically. Um, you know, we, in this podcast, we've talked a little bit about some of the, the real problems and some of the impact on people and the fact that people are dying, you know, and uh, this kind of raises the ethical stakes, I think. And uh, when you start getting lots of people suffering and dying, uh, it seems to me that there's a right and a wrong here. And the right is to try to keep people alive and help them live better lives. That seems to me to be the right. Um, and so I would argue for those who sometimes just feel like they've just given up because there's, there's no hope or, or something like that. Uh, this is a time to think of it from a, a, an ethical point of view and, and just say, there's something about just doing the right thing, which is, very useful, very good. Um, 
it may be that your neighbors aren't doing anything about it or uh, not don't care, but at least you can do something about it, you know, and, and uh, by doing the right thing, um, you're, you're contributing to a solution to, to helping to deal with the problem. And you may not see it. You may not see grand vistas opening up the front front of you or something like that. But the idea that, you know, that by your actions, you are not as responsible as some others perhaps for, um, for causing human suffering or destruction of the earth or something like that. Um, there, there's, a, there's a joy in that, just simply knowing that you do the right thing. And so I would encourage people to, to maybe think of it ethic, ethically and, and hope that that would be a, something that they can just do it because it's right. You so know? whether I ever see the results or not, whether I live to see things change for the better, it doesn't matter yeah, because it, I'm doing the right thing. I yeah, made the right choice. I, I, I kind of agree with that. And I, uh, it'd be great if you could see the results of your actions and we'd like to see that, but um, just doing what's right is a reward in its own self, just doing the right thing. Again, it sounds almost trite to say that, but um, there's a lot of truth and wisdom, I think, in that, so. Wonderful. Thank you, Rich. You betcha. That's a good closing comment. I appreciate you. your being available and giving us your time and, and energy to do the podcast for us and to do the webinars. For those of you who would like to um, see the webinars that Rich did for us, they're on seaofchristclimatejustice.org. So uh, check us out. They're all archived there and you can watch those webinars and others as well. Great. Thanks. It's my pleasure to do this. I, I really enjoyed that. And I, I appreciate the honor you gave me and bringing me in and letting me be part of this. Thank you. I appreciate your being part of this. Yay. Yeah. Go Rich. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much. All right. Bye-bye for now. Bye. Thanks for listening to Project Zion Podcast. Subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcast, Stitcher, or whatever podcast streaming service you use, and while you are there, give us a five-star rating. Project Zion Podcast is sponsored by Latter-day Seeker Ministries of Community of Christ. The views and opinions expressed in this episode are of those speaking and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Latter-day Seeker Ministries or Community of Christ. The music has been graciously provided by Dave Hines. 